Hi, welcome. I'm Professor Nugent, and this is Chapter Two. We're going to talk. We're going to be talking about the financial markets. Now, when you run a business as a financial manager, you need capital, or what we capital is another word for money in finance. So you need external sources to obtain money to help run and grow your business, and you can get them from financial institutions like banks, financial markets like stock markets or through private placements, which would be wealthy individuals or investment groups that want to put money into your company. Now, when we're talking about financial institutions, these are the intermediaries. They're basically taking money from savers and then um, passing it through uh, to, to people who are demanding the money as far as wanting to borrow it. So uh, they are a sort of like a channel where the savings, which come from individuals, businesses, or governments, they all can save money, and they're going to channel it into loans and investments. Now, the key suppliers and demanders of funds, like I said, are individuals, businesses, and governments. Now, typically, individuals are the ones who are saving most of the money, while governments and businesses are the ones who are spending or demanding the money. Now, let's talk about some of these intermediaries. One, one intermediary you might be very familiar with is commercial banks. So, these are uh, just sort of like regular banks where you can save money and they will offer, so you can go to the save money, the interest, the interest we earn in the money we save is very little, uh, but they, these banks will offer loans to individuals and business owners. So when you want to buy a business or buy a house, these commercial banks will help uh, with that. Now, investment banks are completely different than commercial banks. Uh, invest, investment banks assist companies in raising capital. So investment banks can help place IPOs, uh, <clears throat> organize private placements, or uh, uh, create bonds, and they can advise on major transactions like mergers and acquisitions and financial restructuring. Um, so the investment bank is a more highly specialized bank that doesn't deal with individuals but only deals with facilitating uh, capital through businesses. Now the shadow banking system is any other type of company like an insurance company that or um, even a pension plan that wants to loan money out for a return. So there are other businesses besides investment in commercial banks that will make loans um, to individuals or companies. And that's what we call shadow banking because they're out of the two, two traditional banking companies. Now, in ninth, we had this Great Depression in the 30s. And, and part of this Great Depression was banks were, banks were going crazy with loans and 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 just debt and the stock market was being ramped up very quickly because of all the margin debt and we we had uh, a contraction a very severe, severe contraction in the economy and because of this the Glass-Steagall Act was enacted in Congress in 1933 and it created the Federal Deposit Insurance Program and it separated the activities of commercial investment banks and it said that com commercial banks need to be safer and they, they can't take all these big risks because everybody's money is with commercial banks all the individuals but will investment banks um, they can't compete at a commercial level, and commercial banks can't be, and compete with investment banks. But in 1999, they thought it was a good idea to repeal this. And that opened up the doors for um, banks to become more aggressive in uh, financial engineering and spend, uh, uh, specialized lending and loan policy and practices. And it also uh, paved the way for a shadow banking system, which I was talking about before, that can engage in lending activities uh, much like the traditional banks, uh, but they're not going to accept any deposits. So they're, since they don't accept any deposits, they're not subject to the same regulations as traditional banks, and they can do even crazier things uh, with, uh, with money than the banking system, since they're not regulated. And that's part of, you know, that caused problems, which we're going to talk about later when we go over the Great Recession. Okay, so because of this, this 1999 um, repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act, the U.S. banking system 
went through a lot of uh, consolidation. Uh, and according to FDIC, the number of commercial banks in the United States declined from 11,000 to 6,000, uh, a decline of almost 50%. And that's because these banks were getting bigger, consolidating, and you know, the bigger you are as a bank, the more you can do. So a lot of the small community banks were gobbled up by larger institutions. So a, there was a point where Washington Mutual was a, a bank that went around buying all these local um, small commercial banks. And a small commercial bank might be just like a regional bank that has 11 branches or 20 branches that just in one county or two counties. And we actually had a number of them in Suffolk County. And then, you know, a company like Washington Mutual came in and bought them all up. Uh, also, Chase and Bank of America were aggressive in these areas as well. We, uh, and then with the Great Recession, Washington Mutual went bankrupt and Chase bought the assets of Washington Mutual and became, you know, a huge bank as far as their number of locations in the U.S. Okay, so let's talk about financial markets. The financial markets is basically a place where suppliers of funds can get, the, can get together with demanders of funds and they can make transactions directly. Um, uh, they can make transactions in the short term, marketable securities. Um, and this is a place where money markets are created while, and while transactions in longer term securities take place in financial markets that are called capital markets. So short term, anything less than a year, any type of uh, investment that's, that has an expiration date less than 12 months would be handled in the money market or marketable securities environment and then the longer term securities like stocks and bonds would be in the capital markets. Now a private placement would be basically selling directly to an investor or a small group of investors. So sometimes a company doesn't want to go public because that's a lot of expense and cost um, and a lot of additional regulation they'd have to follow so they may want to just get some uh, advanced financing from a private placement. But most most large corporations will do public offering. Uh, and they'll sell bonds or stocks to the general public to raise funds to grow their business. Now, there, in the capital markets, there are two markets, a primary and a secondary. The primary market is where the IPOs and bonds are initially offered for sale and the companies can draw uh, capital from that. And then the secondary market is where the, the securities will trade, uh, the pre-owned securities will trade, and it, in the in the companies really get no benefit from that as far as new money. So think of it like this, sort of like the textbook store. Um, there could be a section in the textbook store where there are new books. That would be the primary market. And there might be a section in the textbook store where there are used books for sale, and that would be the secondary market. So the textbook publisher gets money when you buy the book for the first time in the primary market, but then the textbook company gets no money if, if you resell your textbook to somebody else. So think of it like that. Okay, here's a little flow of funds. So if we look in here, we could see that um, we have we have financial institutions at the top and financial markets at the bottom, and then we have supplier of funds. These are mostly small small individuals and demander of funds, which are businesses and the government and private placement. So private placement here is directly in the middle. So uh, supplier of funds through private placement can provide funds to the demanders of funds. And eventually those get paid back to the suppliers. Now, you also have the financial institutions that they're going to take uh, suppliers of funds are going to give funds to the financial institutions. Uh, then the financial institutions can turn around and give those funds to the uh, demander, demanders of funds like businesses. Uh, now, and of course, the financial institutions will give back shares of deposits to the supplier. Uh, okay. So if we look at the financial markets, financial markets are also going to provide funds to uh, businesses and governments. Now, the financial institutions will take the money that is supplied to them, and they'll take that money and they'll put it in the financial markets. And then the financial markets will return securities to um, the financial institutions, stocks and bonds. All right. And suppliers of funds can also sometimes access the financial markets directly 
and then the financial markets can um, give those funds to the Mandara funds. So there are many avenues. These arrows are all avenues. And, they, and eventually, say a bond is due to be paid back, the bond will be pay, paid back, and then that money will go back to the supplier of funds. So there's a lot of connections between suppliers of funds and demanders of funds, and the three access points are the financial institutions, financial markets, and private placement. All right. Okay, so let's talk about the money market. The money market uh, is created, it creates a relationship between suppliers and demanders of what we say the short-term funds. Uh, and the short-term funds could be U.S. Treasury bills, it could be commercial paper issued by businesses, uh, negotiable certificates deposit by financial institutions. So these are all short-term instruments. The You're going to consider these marketable securities or money market to be a very safe investment. And that's what the mo most attractive feature of them is that they're safe. Okay. However, they provide very little return. Now, there is an international equivalent called the euro currency market where euros are um, the dominant currency in that money market. And, and so even if you're a short term uh, uh, bank deposited denominated, um, you can, they can also make besides euros, they can make denominations in U.S. dollars as well as you know, other currencies. So the, U, the euro market is basically a mu, uh, money market outside the, New York, outside the U.S. Uh, it's unregulated. Because it doesn't, because it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't need to meet the uh, international borrowers and lenders. Um, if I'm sorry, if it meets the international borrowers and lenders uh, regulations, uh, but the euro deposit or euro currency market isn't so big for um, most American citizens. We use generally use the American money markets, but the rest of the world, there are some countries that want to invest. Uh, in money markets and dollars, but don't necessarily want to go through the American exchanges. Why would that be? Well, say if you're a country like Iran, who used to have sanctions that can't access our money markets, or maybe a country like Russia that doesn't want to keep a lot of deposits inside of American institutions. So the euro, the euro uh, currency market was created to facilitate countries that don't necessarily want to do business through American channels. Okay. Capital markets. So let's talk about capital markets. These are the long-term funds, stocks, bonds, and preferred stocks. So these securities um, are anything greater than a year. And we have them, you know, uh, equity or ownership in the company. Now, when we talk about bonds, these are basically money that businesses borrow from individuals that pay a dividend. So I lend, I lend a, I buy a bond in a company and they're going to pay me a 5% what they call a coupon or it's an interest rate. And at the end of the term of the bond, maybe it's a 10 year bond, they pay me the thousand dollars back. Uh, common stock are units of ownership inside of a company. So if I buy shares of stock, I get a small piece of ownership of a company and, and, uh, hopefully the stock prices go up and I make capital returns. And preferred stock is sort of like a hybrid between bonds and stock. Preferred stock, is like a bond that you get a guaranteed dividend, but it's also like a stock because it's a, it's a form of uh, ownership. However, the key difference is in the preferred stock over the bond is it never expires, where bonds do expire. Okay, so if we're looking at the bonds, say we have this Lakeview Industries, um, a major microprocessor manufacturer, and they issue a 9% coupon, which means they're gonna pay interest of 9% per year for 20 year bond with a thousand dollar par value, which means the par value just means that the bond, the initial value of the bond is a thousand dollars. So you can buy this bond as an investor and you receive the contractual right to get $90 uh, annual interest. Um, distributed twice a year. So you get $45 every six months over the next 20 years. At the end of the 20 years, you get your thousand dollars back. But that $1,000 isn't worth as much 20 years from now that it is today, and that's what the, the interest rate is supposed to compensate for. All right. Okay, so I'm going to skip that slide. Uh, broker markets and dealer markets. These are just two different uh, markets that are have been created to facilitate the trading of um, the two sides, connecting the buyers and sellers. 
to trade any type of securities. And here, here we'll talk mostly about stocks. So trading can take place on trading floors, such as the New York Stock Exchange, as well as regional stock exchanges in the broker markets. The, uh, the broker markets basically are, they're creating um, the two sides of the transaction. So they're going to bring together the buyer and seller. And so the, the seller wants to sell stock, the buyer wants to buy stock, and they're going to connect those two together uh, through um, a trading floor like the New York Stock Exchange. A dealer market is very similar, except the dealer market is going to work over computer networks, and they're going to actually make the market in the security. So they're not necessarily connecting... Um, The, the, the buyer and the seller together directly, they're sort of the indirect middleman. So they go and make an inventory of stock and then they'll sell to whoever who wants to, to buy it and they'll buy it to whoever who wants to sell it, but it may not be the same two people getting connected. So there's no direct follow through from one person to the other. So they're keeping sort of an inventory in the middle to um, execute the orders. Uh, and this works, uh, there's no centralized trading floor. It's all done through computers um, and they're linked together through this network, so they kind of, you know, it's it's very efficient. It's 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 the economics of you know supply and demand, and whoever has who's ever offering the stock the lowest price is who you're going to buy it from, and the, um, the way these market makers, why you might say, why do these dealers want to make a market? What's in it for them? Well, what's in it for them is the spread. So the difference between the bid price and the ask price. So could be 25, 50 cents, uh, 10 cents, they'll get that on every transaction. So holding the inventory, there's a risk in holding the inventory in case the stock price moves down, but to compensate them for these risks of making the market, uh, they get the spread, the difference between the bid price and the ask price. Okay, so in 2012, the, um, the New York Stock Exchange, which is also the Euro Next, they bought that exchange, is the largest stock exchange in the world measured by total value of securities. So they are, in, in 2012, they're measured about 14 trillion. In 2015, they're more like 17 trillion um, in, um, in the US and about 2 trillion in Europe, or maybe today it's about 3 trillion. So you see that the US is a big, US equities are a big part of this market. And the second biggest area would be the NASDAQ, which uh, trade securities is about um, 4.6 million in 2012, maybe closer to 6 trillion in 2015. The Tokyo Stock Exchange has about 3.5 trillion, and the fourth largest exchange, the London Stock Exchange, is 3.3 trillion. All right. International capital markets, we also have the Euro bond market, where uh, corporations and governments can issue bonds dominated in dollars and sell them to investors outside the United States. So they could sell um, American dollar denominated bonds to outside, inv outside investors outside the United States. There's also the foreign bond market, which is a bond market issued by uh, foreign co uh, corporations and government that are de denominated in foreign currencies like the Euro or the Yen. And the international equity market allows corporations to sell blocks of stock of shares to investors in a number of different countries simultaneously. So if you're you're a big, you know, a big company and you want to sell stock outside of the United States stock exchanges, you can use this international equities market. And again, for financial managers, all these different markets are access to capital. Because if you're running a company, you need money to expand. So if you have a great idea, if you're Chipotle and you want to you have a great idea for a restaurant that's really working and doing well, you want to expand that idea as fast as possible before a competitor copies you and takes over. So they need to borrow money and Chipotle access the bond market and the uh, stock market, more so the stock market, to raise funds to accelerate the opening of new restaurants. And if they didn't do that, they, it would be very slow for them to open new restaurants just based on the profits of, of their existing restaurants. So that's sort of the role of the capital markets is to provide funding and liquidity to firms that want to um, expand their businesses. And so from an investor's perspective, you buy stock in Chipotle, uh, you, you get a chance to participate in the growth of that business. So the efficient markets, the capital markets are supposed to be efficient, where they're gonna value and price the stocks, the bonds to be competitive, to maximize um, the wealth of investors. 
Now, you can see this in, say, Chipotle stock when they have um, problems with um, viruses and disease in their food, then their stock price goes down. And why is the stock price going down? Because uh, investors are saying they're not as valuable as they were. They were more valuable when they were untarnished and, and, didn't, and didn't make anybody sick. But now that they made a few hundred people sick, they're less valuable and the stock price goes down. And the markets are efficient that way to determine what they believe is close to true value for bonds and stocks. So that way, when you buy something, hopefully you're getting something at a, a, an effective uh, price that's related to the value of the company. Now, behavioral finance is a field where they look at um, ideas for finance and psychology and try to argue that, bond, that stocks prices uh, and bond prices uh, can deviate from their true value for extended periods. And examples of this could be stock markets that uh, um, maybe wild, wildly overvalue stocks. And we had that in the late 1990s. Stocks were wildly overvalued and, you know, that related that turned into a internet stock market bubble crash in 2000 um, and it could be a failure of markets to accurately uh, assess the risks of uh, certain investments like the risks of mortgage-backed securities which led to another financial crisis so sometimes the markets aren't always efficient or perfect now as far as ethics in the financial markets there can be a lot of shenanigans by traders and insider trading could be where traders get information directly from companies that investors don't know about and they can start making trades and making profits based on this information and there's been a, n a number of people who've got in trouble for doing this and laws this used to happen all the time before the 30s but laws were created to prevent uh and to punish insider trading make it basically the laws say that if you're going to release inf information that information has to be released to everybody fairly um and so you got to think about you know if, if the market is, is, is going to be efficient if that's a goal of the market is allowing or disallowing insider trading um more unethical if you're trying to create a um efficient market i think if you're trying to create an efficient market information needs to be shared equally uh, on stocks and bonds not just to a select few Okay. Now let's talk about the financial crisis uh, and the role of financial institutions in, the, in, in real estate finance. So what basically, uh, securitization, we need to understand what securitization is. And securitization is the pooling of mortgages uh, and creating a new and bigger investment. So they take um, all these individual mortgages and they package them together and then they're going to sell them in the secondary market as a safer investment so you're if you're investing in 5,000 mortgages that you're you're sort of uh, diversified among 5,000 different people who have those mortgages so if we offer them in the secondary market we can call this a mortgage-backed security and that's going to represent now as a mortgage-backed security you can buy into that package of mortgages and you're going to get cash flow generated by the interest on those mortgages and then lots of um people purchase these individual investors pension funds mutual funds because they were supposed to be very safe because the idea was you know real estate doesn't go down in value so if a mortgage gets in trouble the bank can resell the house for more money and problem solved um, now the big risk here is if ho homeowners the big risk is that if real estate prices go down and homeowners don't pay their mortgages then those loans are going to go uh, bad and then that's the biggest risk but no one thought that could ever happen uh, however um, for the most part housing prices rose consistently from 1987 to 2006 which kept, kept mortgage default rates very low which made these um, these mortgage-backed securities seem even more safer so lenders started relaxing the standards now that we don't have all that pesky uh, we have less regulations on banks they started relaxing the standards for borrowers and creating subprime, subprime mortgages which are basically if you have a heartbeat you can get a mortgage no job no problem no income no problem no credit history no problem um, we'll give you a mortgage and that's what the subprime market was so 
too many of these subprime mortgages were issued too aggressively and there's a disconnect of responsibility between the people issuing it and where the, the mortgage landed. So the people creating these mortgages were not personally responsible if the mortgages were not paid. So they were landing in these, these securitized investment packages and sort of now the responsibility of the risk of the mortgage being defaulted were on the investors. And investors had no idea there was any risk. So this disconnect is what allowed all these subprime mortgages to be created. Now, in 2006, the Federal Reserve started raising interest rates. And when they started raising interest rates, uh, the adjustable rate adjustable rates in these subprime mortgages started to go up. Also about this time, a lot of the aggressive mortgages that were written in 2003, 2004, 2005 had these short-term adjustable rates where in the beginning you may have paid no interest. So some of these mortgages had no interest for the first three years and then the interest would kick in. And that led to a lot of um, uh, houses, people who uh, living in houses they couldn't afford, so then they started trying to sell their house, and then we had the housing prices decline from 2006 to 2009 because the borrowers couldn't make the payments when these tricky mortgages started to kick in in, in higher uh, costs. So getting a fixed mortgage, you know what you're going to pay. Getting an adjustable rate or a special no-interest mortgage where the rate will change, your monthly payment will change, is what these people didn't understand. So as a result, there's a sharp increase the number of delinquencies and foreclosures. Here's a chart of how the housing prices have soared from eight, January 1987 to, say, let's look at around 2007, the peak. And then you could see the um, big collapse right in here. This is the big collapse of housing prices and then sort of a kind of recovery happening after then. Now also, uh, bank stocks started to fall when we had that 2008 um, started the bank failures because these a lot of these banks that had some of these loans on their books and these you know these bank stocks that had these secure had the responsibility of these mortgage-backed securities they started to fail uh, with a peak around 2010 and then starting to decline after that. So that we we had the bank stocks fell 81 percent. Um, and the bank fa and the bank failures um, were just incredible. Now, as far as the uh, bank stocks, as far as their stock price, they went from 2008. They went down um, incredibly low, and then made a gradual increase since then. But the bank stocks, the banks that survived, took a hit. Okay, so banks come came under this intense financial pressure in 2008. So they tightened their lending. Uh, standards to compensate for all their poor lending practices and this had sort of like a snapping of a rubber band where companies could no longer raise capital in in the money markets so they um, you know the only capital was available was a very high rate so businesses stopped borrowing and when business began to stop borrowing and hoard cash they stopped expanding they stopped hiring people and that created the economic great uh, recession now the Glass-Spiegel's Act in 1933 also created the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which provides some safety for investors and banks. Uh, and the Glass-Spiegel Act also prohibited institutions that took deposits from engaging in activities such as security underwriting, trading, and effectively separating them from the uh, investment banks. So the FDIC is a good thing because if you have, at, at one point, the limit was 100000 and during the financial crisis, they increased that to 250000 So that way, there'd be no rush on the banks. If you felt like your bank was going to run out of money and the government wasn't going to back it up, you would be running to that bank as fast as possible to take your money out. But since we have this FDIC, it helps banks to be a little bit more stable and not have a run on the bank, which will further increase bank bankruptcies. But in 1999, the Graham-Leach-Bailey Act allowed business combinations or mergers between commercial banks and investment banks, insurance companies, and it permitted these institutions to, to make giant institutions to work together um, that were, perf uh, and the idea was um, ins insurance companies, investment banks, and commercial banks are uncompetitive worldwide because other countries allow them to combine. So if we don't allow these institutions to combine, they won't remain competitive on an international basis. That was the argument. 
So when they did combine, they started doing aggressive things that put the whole system at risk. So these big, big banks, and, and like Bear Stearns that went bankrupt, that they now are risking everyone's money at all levels of the economy. <clears throat> so Congress passed the Dodd-Frank uh, Wall Street Reform uh, Consumer Protection Act in 2010. It's not fully implemented, but that was meant to help remedy this, this, this problem. Let's go back to 1933. And this, this is the year that <clears throat> regulation started to being developed based on the problems of the Great Recession. I'm sorry, the Great Depression. So 1933, the Securities Act uh, starts to regulate <coughs> securities in the, in the primary market. In 1934, they started regulating the trading of securities such as stocks and bonds in the secondary market and created the Securities Exchange Commission that still exists today. And this Security Exchange Commission requires companies to disclose financials um, in the secondary market and imposes limits on the extent in which insiders can trade in their firm security. So if you're, if you're, when they say insiders, they mean mostly people who are working at the company. Um, okay, so these, these securities change <clears throat> since 1934 to today. They've been enacting various regulations to try to keep the financial markets well governed and, and keep the public safe from any, any, any wrongdoing. Now let's switch over to business taxes. So if you're a business, you pay taxes, just like if you're an individual, you pay taxes. So the income of the sole proprietorship and partnerships are going to be taxed at the individual owner level, at indi um, whereas corporations are subject to corporate tax. So if you, um, so if you have a small business, Whatever money that business makes, you take your share and it goes on to your personal income taxes as business income and you pay through your personal tax brackets. But if you're a corporation, the corporation has a separate set of tax brackets that they pay through. So both individuals and businesses can earn two types of income, ordinary, in ordinary income and capital gains income. Ordinary income is income from working or doing business. Capital gains is income from investment. So under the current law, um, there's there's the tax treatment of ordinary income and and tax treatment of capital gains and this um, changes frequently due to the changing of tax laws every so often these are the corporate tax brackets or schedule and here you see <clears throat> the first fifty thousand everybody every business makes is going to pay um, a 15% tax on it. And that 15% tax is 7,500. So if you take 50,000 times 15%, you get the base of 7,500. So the next 25,000, you're going to pay that base uh, plus 25% on that next 20,000, 25,000. Which brings that, if you add that together, that brings it your base now to 13,000. So the next 25,000 you make will be taxed at 34%. And then your base become, you add that to the base, the base becomes 22,000. So if you make $100,000 in income as a business, your base tax is 22,000. <clears> Any money you make over that 100,000 will fall into this next bucket. So maybe your business makes 150,000. <clears> so 50,000. So if you made 150,000, 50,000 would be taxed at 39%. So the more money you make, the more you graduate into these new buckets until you really get to the, the last bucket is any money made over 18 million gets taxed at 35%. Okay, so um, let me kind of show you how this works. So say you make, uh, we'll just say $250,000. So, so you're a business, you make $250,000. So you have to actually, when you have these progressive tax brackets, you have to break that money up into to, to different brackets. So maybe we'll make this bucket and we'll say the first one is at 15% and then we'll make another bucket and we'll say the next bracket is at um, 
and then we'll make another bucket and we'll say this is at um, 28 percent okay so and we'll say that the the first bracket is between 0 and 50,000 Okay, and the second will be between 50 and 100,000. And the third will be between 100 and 300,000. Okay, so you take this money, so you have these three tax brackets. And you have to start out with the first tax bracket, which means you take your money and you're going to put, you're going to fill this tax bracket up to its completion. So you can put $50,000 into this first bucket and then you're going to pay, you're going to take the um, 50000 and multiply it by the 15% tax, whatever that equals. Now since you since you uh, filled up this bucket, you know, think of this almost like water, there's no more room to put the money in here. So how much money do you have left now after the first bucket, you have two thousand two hundred thousand dollars left to be taxed on. So you're going to have to put some of the remaining money into the second bucket. And the second bucket has a capacity of fifty thousand. From one hundred to fifty thousand, there's fifty thousand dollars worth of money that you can place. Think of this red line as money you're filling up the second bucket with. So you could stash another fifty thousand dollars worth of money ta uh, to be taxed in the second tax tax bracket, or what I'm calling a tax bucket. So that means that next 50000 that you're putting in your next bracket means that you're paying, you're going to be paying, you multiply it by 20% or whatever that equals. Okay, so you still now, after you put that money away, you still have 150000 not accounted for. So the first 50000 went to the first bracket, the second 50000 which brought you to 200000 left, and then the second 50000 went into the second tax bracket at a 20% tax rate. So now you only have $150,000 left. But since this third tax bracket is from one hundred to 300000 you can fit that remaining money, all of it, in uh, leaving you at zero. All of it can go into this bucket. But it's not going to fill up the bucket entirely because it's only you only be able to put 150000 in here where the capacity is 300000 so that you're going to only partially fill that bucket. And this becomes, this 28% becomes your marginal rate. So now uh, I had 50,000 at 15%, 50,000 at 20%, and the last 150,000 is going to be uh, multiplied by 0.28. So whatever these three numbers, uh, amounts of money, uh, turn out to be for each of these buckets we're going to total them up so maybe this is I don't know 7,500 7, this could be six um, well 15 percent of 50,000 and then 20 percent so 7,500 10,000 and then 28 percent of 150,000 I'm not sure but maybe that equals some, you know, some total. We take the sum. Try to make a sum sign here. So the sum of these three numbers, and that's your total tax amount. Okay, so that's basically how we break up that amount of money. All right, so let's go back to um, the uh, presentation. What's this? Okay, now the marginal tax rate is what I, what I said was the top tax rate. So whatever your last tax bracket or bucket you left off in, that's the marginal rate, and that's where you're going to be taxed for any new money that comes in. The average tax rate <clears throat> is just going to take whatever your total taxes were and divide it by your total income, and that you get 32%. Okay, And the example that I just did by Penn is not... The, you know, I'm not using the actual tax percentages or buckets that were laid out in the previous slide. Um, I was just showing you a quick example that you need to take a total amount of money and break it up. If I go back, 
you, you take a total amount of income, you have to break it up by these var these variable income ranges to fit it, you know, fit your money in these, what I would call um, buckets, tax buckets. So you have to break up your money because each, each level of money gets taxed at a different rate. Okay. And then we have two rates, the marginal rate. So when we left off, if you have a hundred, you have a $250,000, your, all your money is going to fit into this. You're going to be able to get all your money into the first um, four tax buckets. So your marginal rate is whatever the, the rate is in the last bucket you put your money in, which is going to be this 39%. The average tax rate is going to be your, the total taxes paid divided by your total income gives you an average rate. Okay. Now businesses, interest and dividend income, businesses only pay 70% of all dividend income received from an investment. So for a corporation, 70% of the, div the income you receive, if you receiving income from an investment that pays a dividend, um, if you, okay, the, the, the caveat is um, you have to have owned less than 20% of that other uh, ownership of the of the investment that the dividend is coming from. So only 70% of of the dividend will be excluded from tax. So if, so if a company earns $1,000 in dividends from another company that they have less than 20% ownership in, 70% of that um, or $700 of that uh, dividend will be excluded from any taxation and only have to pay tax on the $300 of that. So that's a great benefit for companies. Um, now, this helps... Um, mitigate the effect of double taxation which incurs when um, you tax a corporate on their earnings and then distribute the cash dividends to other stockholders who must pay personal tax on those the dividend amount so unlike dividend income all interest income received is fully taxable so interest is always fully taxable now <clears throat> since interest is fully taxable it is a tax deduction for businesses. So if you calculate your taxes, you may deduct your interest expense, um, but not your dividends paid. So we, we can create this built-in tax advantages for using debt because the interest on debt will be tax deductible and that means it lowers the cost of debt. Just like if you, if you as a person buy a mortgage and you're gonna itemize your deductions, the interest you pay on your mortgage will help create a, a a, t a tax deduction on your income statement. So let's look at an example. Two companies, debt and no debt company will be number one company, and no debt company will be number two company. Expect the coming year to receive EBIT, earnings before interest and tax, of 200000 During the year, a debt company will pay $30,000 in interest expense, while no debt company will, will pay, they'll pay no interest expense because they have no debt. So if we look at the two companies here, we see that... Um, so the company that has debt, they're able to um, deduct $30,000 from their income. So it makes their taxable income only $170,000. So their taxable liability would be less. So their earnings after tax are $102,000. <clears> now for a company with debt, they can't, they can't use debt and they don't have any interest. So they have no deduction. So they're paying tax on a full $200,000, which means that they're paying $80,000 in tax. However, since they aren't paying the $30,000 in interest expense, they still wound up ahead with $120,000 in earnings after taxes, which is an $18,000 difference. Okay, so as the example shows, using debt financing can increase cash flow because it decreases the taxes you have to pay. So the tax deductibility of the interest is, is beneficial to companies um, Whereas dividends, you can't, you know, you can't deduct the dividends paid so as a result of double taxation uh, from corporations. So borrowing money is definitely has its advantages tax-wise. Now, a capital gain, uh, if a business receives a capital gain, meaning that, you know, as, as an example, um, anytime you buy a stock and you sell a stock at a higher price, you receive a capital gain. Or you could buy a piece of equipment and sell a piece of equipment at a higher price than you bought it at, and that's also a capital gain. And that's going to be treated um, as ordinary income uh, 
for corporations. So, you know, Ross Company sold, they say they sold a um, $150,000 asset that they purchased for $125,000, which means they made a $25,000 capital gain, which they're going to have to pay tax on. And that will just be added to their income and they'll whatever their marginal tax rate is, that's the rate they're going to pay on that, as long as that additional capital gain fits within that tax bucket. Okay, so to sum up this lecture, we learned about financial institutions and how they play a role in financial management of companies. Financial institutions basically allow companies to access to funds. We talked about uh, the functions of financial institutions and financial markets. We described the difference between capital markets and money markets. We explained the root cause of the 2008 financial crisis and recession. And we understand the regulations on uh, corporations, banks, uh, and investment banks. And we discussed the, the importance of financial decision making based on tax taxes. Okay, so now uh, that's the chapter review. Please remember to go to My Finance Lab. There are homework questions waiting for you. And thank you so much for your time, and I'll be seeing you soon.